I got in too young. I got in just after my 22nd birthday, um, which made older men resent me for being there as a young upstart. <clears throat> and I hadn't, I wasn't mature enough to know when to keep my gob shut either. So um, I would say I, I expected standards to be somewhat higher. Um, but, um, and I voiced those concerns with a view to trying and improving it. But I was too young, I was a new boy, and I should just keep quiet. But when you had people coming into rooms to take lessons who didn't even understand, didn't understand the basic principles of taking a lesson, let alone the material they were trying to teach. Um, I'll give you one example. I had a, a sergeant, a staff sergeant, who came to the room to give a mortar fire control lesson when we're going down to the Falklands. And he left out direction and type of fire. Now, if you know anything about the trigonometry of artillery fire, without the direction, you have no idea where the rounds are going to land. You know, it's a, it's a piece of mathematics that counts to make sure the bombs land in the right place. And when I complained about it after the lesson, I was told I had a bad attitude. <laughs> so where do you go with that? Um, the regiment are good at what they do, but they're not necessarily good at everything. They're not knights in white shiny armor. They're not all heroes. Some beat up their wives. Some uh, neglect their kids. Um, but, you know, most of them are good soldiers at the jobs they're trained to do and required to do. Um, it, they're, not all, they're not all as special as the mythology would like to make them. That's for sure. And is the selection... <clears throat> Well, let me just ask you, what was your experience of it? Well, I did it twice. The first time I did it, I failed. <clears throat> I got into test week, which is the um, SAS selection lasts a year. And the first four weeks is in the mountains. And the last five days in the mountains is test week, where you do uh, increasing distances with increasing weights. So you start at 18 miles and you end up with the last march at 40 miles and there's a minimum time. And you have to do these things on your own. So it's nothing like the television programs. There's nobody cajoling you or pushing you or encouraging you. It's basically, <clears throat> here's your next checkpoint, get there. And when you get there, you get given the next one and the next one. And everybody's doing slightly different routes. So you can't follow people. Um, my test week was in the coldest winter for many years in uh, January 1979. I'd failed in the summer 1978. There were 67 of us on it. And um, uh, one person, nobody can got to the first checkpoint on uh, endurance, which is the 40 mile march, because the weather was so horrendous. And one person died. <clears throat> so they, um, they sent 22 of us off to the jungle to do jungle training. And when we got back from the jungle, they passed nine of us. And then we went on and then we did combat survival training. Um, and at the end of that, they failed one person. So there's only eight of us left. And then those guys that weren't already paras went off to do their parachute training. And then you join your squadron and you get your cap badge, but you're on probation for six months. And you have to learn a personal skill and a troop skill. And my personal skill was as a paramedic. And my troop skill was as a mountain climber. And then at the end of the year, so my, my um, selection officially started on January the 7th, 1978. And on January the 7th, 1979, I was officially classed on my military records as being a qualified SAS soldier. So you get that a year afterwards. And then you stay for another two years and then you'll reassess. And if you, you, then you can stay for another three years and you'll reassess. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of paranoia um, about everything. You can't afford to fail. But it's um, one of the things about the selection process, it selects people to be individuals. Whereas when you're selected to be a booty or you're selected to be a para, you're selected to work strongly as a team. And the weakest man, everyone has a bad day, you know, um, looking after the weakest man and so on, because you're a unit. Whereas uh, when you're selected to be individuals, that can be great when you're working in tiny groups or alone. But when you're working... Um, when you're, uh, everybody thinks they should be in charge. <laughs> so it can cause uh, an awful lot of friction. 
you need to keep guys like that very, very busy and very, very focused all the time. When they've got nothing to do, they start fighting amongst themselves. Robin, what, what year was the embassy siege? The embassy was May the 5th, 1980. Oh, 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah, two years before the Falklands. May the 5th, 1980. And it was the day when everybody suddenly discovered uh, that the SAS existed. A lot of people didn't know it existed before that. Even in the British Army, a lot of people didn't know it existed. It was a very small unit, 250 bad soldiers, four Sabre squadrons, supported by about another 200 men in darkest Herefordshire. And um, it was a great place to be and a great unit to be with. Um, the mission itself was, was a great mission. Um, you know, I had my part in it. But um, it lasted seven minutes, really. Um, whereas, you know, walking the streets of Northern Ireland uh, in the Ardoin, in the Valley Murphy, night after night, waiting for somebody to choose the ground and shoot you, was a far more frightening experience. I mean, fifth, uh, n nearly 50 of us went into the Iranian embassy and um, we rescued 19 people. We rescued, we saved 19 people's lives. We killed five terrorists, captured one, but we saved 19 people's lives, which is an important thing, which is what we were there to do. Um, but it, it, it changed because suddenly people started to believe their own press. And suddenly, you know, that uh, anonymous group that had a good budget, that could do all sorts of amazing things, was under the spotlight. And, um, you know, the regiment changed, and um, I don't think it necessarily changed for the better during my time. Because at the same time, the British Army brought in this, you know, if you've done a certain amount of time, you have to be promoted. You have to carry so much rank after three years, six years, nine years. And uh, suddenly guys who weren't really qualified were suddenly given rank that, um, that they, they didn't even pass their education promotion certificates for. And uh, that created a lot of frustration. Guys that would have been happy to let brighter people, more ambitious people go past them were suddenly forced to carry rank. And it damaged the SES for quite a long time. Did you ever, Robin, when you were obviously lining up to go through, go through the, those doors and windows, I mean, I, I know the, obviously know the answer to my own question, but did you ever imagine the legendary status that would be bestowed on not just yourselves, but that mission? Yeah, it's only, I mean, afterwards, you're excited. You're, I mean, I was 23. Um, you're excited, you're anonymous, you disappear into back to Hereford, nobody knows who you are, you're not allowed to talk about it, and you get on with your job. It's the rest of the nation that's excited about it. Um, and because we were taken back to Hereford and allowed to get on with our role and our jobs, and we were anonymous, um, we, 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 most of us didn't get uh, too full of hubris. Most of us carried on and tried to just get on with the, the, the life that we'd had before. It was, only, it was only as time passed and you got the anniversaries. I mean, me, John McAleese and Tom McDonald um, only spoke about it on camera 25 years later uh, when uh, Louise Norman did a famous BAFTA winning, winning um, documentary, SAS Embassy Siege, which was really, really good and very, very accurate. Um, but it took us 25 years to talk about it or write about it. So I think we kept our, our part of the bargain very, very well. Um, but it is a, a huge part of British history that anybody that was alive at that time and remembers it, the Americans had tried 10 days before to go into Tehran and rescue their own hostages uh, in the American embassy in Iran. And the mission had gone wrong. And um, through accidents and failures, and they killed eight of their own men. And it was a big disaster. So the world morally was on a big low. And this lifted not only British people, but it lifted the whole world who suddenly realized, yes, we can do something about terrorists. We can fight back against the PLO who are blowing people up. Um, it, it did put the um, IRA on the back foot as well in a big way. Um, they became even more frightened of the SAS than they previously were. 
knowing that if we caught them, you know, the chances are they were going to perish. So, yeah, it was a big, a big change. Gosh, was it ever. I'm guessing it, for the British public, the thing that was so both shocking and impressive all rolled into one was the fact that other than war films, you didn't actually see yeah. British forces or any force engage the enemy. And yet there it was in broad daylight in our capital city. Yeah. Not only that, but hang on, this army's wearing black. That what's that about? Um, <laughs> yeah, and every 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 terrorist group, every counter terrorist group since then decided to wear black. I mean, somebody decided we would be, wear black army um, boiler suits, and that's what they were. They were boilers, you know, um, green boiler suits dyed black. <laughs> they weren't fireproof. Um, everybody thinks we wore balaclavas. We didn't. We wore gas masks and gas suits with gas hoods on. And so this idea of balaclavas uh, came because two guys who were on the outside periphery on the uh, cordon decided to rush up to the wall and try to get involved. And they were wearing balaclavas. But um, no, we weren't wearing balaclavas. Um, so there's all, there's all kinds of mythology and nonsense that has come out afterwards. Um, you know, the, that, that terrible film that came out some t- a couple of years back, Six Days, um, I wrote the review about it in the Daily Mail. I mean, it was just such a such a disaster, such a misrepresentation of what actually happened and the characters involved. When people characterise soldiers, they want to characterise them as some kind of um, EastEnders, Danny Dyer, odd man, you know, can't shut his mouth and talk to that. You know, and we, we, you know, and I know that there's so many of the British Army who are really, really smart, intelligent guys who can do so many things so well. It's just that they've got that job and that role to do. And I I really do uh, hate it when uh, special forces, paras, marines, uh, uh, all members of the British Armed Forces are portrayed as dumb, enlisted man idiots. Um, Because there are are some of them that are, that's the truth. (laughs) But... uh, the majority are really, really smart guys who just haven't had the advantages that other people had at the beginning of their lives. And that's a lot of the reasons why we end up um, running businesses, presenting podcasts, um, writing books, running corporations, um, traveling around the world, um, doing many, many things and getting qualified and going to university later in life. So many of my infantry junior leader battalion friends uh, ended up with master's degrees. You wouldn't believe how many. <laughs> yeah, that's, that sounds like a Donald Trump. Comment. You wouldn't believe how many. <laughs> but, uh, were you, Robin, were you it portrayed in that film? I'm just wondering if I saw, if, if you're, because they only listed like two names at, at, at the end, yeah. of John Mack being one of them, obviously. Yeah. I guess they came no, I, I, it's hard to say because the story's so um, irrelevant. As I say, there were there were 48 of us that went into the building, and there were there were uh, five teams of eight, one for each floor. So, and there were two teams: the blue team and the red team, led by two captains. And the idea that a lance corporal, in any shape or form, would have an influence over how the mission was run, and uh, they portrayed this, the squadron commander Hector Gullen as uh, as a person who was going to be told what to do by his sergeants. I mean. Nothing could be further than the truth. Gullen was a, a roughy, toughy uh, man who was in charge, and there was no doubt about it. And he planned and uh, coordinated the whole mission from start to finish and didn't get an award. Um, there were some brave things done on the day, but the whole team did the job. Um, the, um, and, you know, it, it, just, it, just wasn't, it just wasn't right. Um, the way the... Uh, imagery, the way the characterizations, the way the story was presented. The only true bits in it were the bits that they cut and pasted from the um, television reports. <laughs> and that's that's sad. I'd hope for better. I'd really hope for better. Mm. There you go. Where were you when the Falklands kicked off? Um, I was in Hereford. Um, our job was to uh, fly down to 
uh, Ascension Island, get onto two C-130 Hercules, fly into Argentina, land on one runway where the Super Entente jets were flying from, the ones that had sunk our capital ships, and uh, destroy them on the ground, and then be killed or captured. So that was our mission. And um, we prepared for it. We got halfway. Um, but the, predominantly the Marines and paratroopers were advancing across towards Stanley quite successfully. And um, the um, Ronald Reagan's government put pressure on Margaret Thatcher not to extend the war onto the mainland. Um, and so we held on Ascension Island and um, the mission was eventually cancelled. Uh, my wife was eight months pregnant at the time, which was um, an interesting dynamic. Um, but um, coming towards the end, before Stanley had fallen, we um, managed to get our mission reinstated, but to fly down, parachute into the sea, and uh, carry out any mission that was required, perhaps attack Stanley from the rear. And um, we got down there, parachuted into the sea, and the RAF hadn't put the parachutes on the rigs properly. And uh, all our kit, the parachutes came off the containers and all our kit went to the bottom of the sea. <laughs> and then, um, you know, the Argentinians heard that half a B squadron arrived with no kit, so they surrendered. <laughs> <laughs> What, what was Stanley like then, Robin? It, it was it, on the on the news footage. It just looked a mess. Yeah. Um, anybody that's been into Wales and Sunnybridge, um, or Exeter and Dartmoor, will uh, recognise um, the Falkland Islands. And essentially, I, I described it as Sunnybridge without trees. Um, there's even less shelter, um, but it's cold. It's wet. It's miserable. It's grey and it's bitterly bitterly cold because of the damp um so when i got into stanley um i went to see some old mates at two para and uh hung out with them for a little while then went back to the ship lancelot i was on lancelot and um i got a message on the um over the radio that on the 18th of um 18th of june that my um my first son alex had been born four days after the surrender. So yeah, that was, um, was a surreal in a sense that it's too far away to, you know, re really be able to enjoy it. And I got home when he was 10 days old. So, yeah. Wow. And how long, um, how long after the Falklands did, did you stay in the forces? Um, I left the, um, I left the British army in uh, November, 1984. Um, I'd been set up by one or two people that didn't like me and um, we had a new squadron commander who didn't know very much about the guys and um, I ended up in the colonel's office and the colonel said you haven't done anything wrong this horse this time horseful but you're uh, you've been walking on a razor blade for a long time um, so I'm gonna punish you and send you back to the parachute regiment so that's cool you know, I haven't done anything wrong, but you're going to punish me. And I said, that's all right, sir. I put my papers in to buy out yesterday. He said, don't do that horseful. He said, the wind blows cold on the outside. I said, it don't blow too effing warm in here, does it, sir? <laughs> and um, I was discharged from the army uh, from Hereford within two weeks. And my life moved on and I was 27 years old. I'd been in for 12 years. Um, it was my life. I was going to be a... 22 year soldier but um i got stitched up um and i was very very bitter at the time but i moved on and um and did lots of, and it allowed me to explore my true potential shall we say there's lots of things i could never have done had i stayed in the british army that i did as a as a result of that departure so sometimes the worst things that happen in life turn out to be some of the best <laughs> 